So, um, Patty, I want to start by uh, making you talk about being a, a book scout. One of my favorite things in, um, in, in Just Kids was uh, your incredible attentiveness to not just the fact that you were scuffling for uh, rare books to make money, but that you'd say, you know, the pages were lightly foxed or all the plates were in place. And, and it just gave me such a thrill. It made me remember my own days, uh, you know, as a, as a book hound, uh, imagining what I could turn some item over for. Well, uh, I grew up in the uh, 50s where um, most people in America after World War II were getting rid of their old stuff. They didn't want their grandfather or their parents' stuff. They, they didn't want the nice porcelain. They wanted Melmac. They didn't want these old leather-bound books. They wanted the Reader's Digest collection. So even as a child, I would go to like... Uh, uh, rummage sales or church bazaars and uh, pick out books that, you know, for like pennies, uh, a quarter. Um, I got a first edition Dickens with a green velvet cover with a tissue guard with a gravure of Dickens. Um, it, it's just you could get things like that. And they always... Even, I mean, it's never gone away, my love of the book, the paper, the font, uh, the cloth covers, which all of these things are slowly dying out. But, yeah. um, and did you work at rare, rare bookshops at one point? I only worked at one. I worked at Argosy Books in 1967, uh, though I falsified my credentials as a book restorer. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> The old fella who ran Argosy um, was very touched by me, and he tried to train me, but I uh, spilt rabbit glue all over a 19th century Bible <laughs> that he said was not really rare. It was just, he was, it was a trainer Bible. He was, <laughs> so he had to let me go. So that was my brief time in a, in a rare book uh, and, store. And you still collect... Uh, not maybe not uh, systematically, but you have precious oh, yeah. artifacts. I mean, we you were, showed yes. me a few amazing, amazing things. Uh, Patty, let me uh, hold uh, uh, Arthur Rambeau's calling card this morning. I have uh, I have such nice things. I have a couple of letters of H. P. Lovecraft, a watercolor of Herman Hesse's. I have uh, a page from uh, Jim Morrison's last notebook. And, um, and w which all of these things, I mean, we don't really own. We're, we have a guardianship of for a while. And uh, I, they're, my t they're my things. You know, I look at them and play with them. Well, and, you've, uh, just, you've handed me my, my next question, which is I always feel that this relationship, uh, the collector's relationship, also connects very strongly to an attitude of, um, well, you cur something curatorial in it, but also you know, you've been a, a collage artist your whole life. You've cut things up to make other things out of them. And you've been an a, appropriator, you know. I mean, in, in, in gestures as simple as, you know, recording uh, Hey Joe and Gloria as among your first songs, you know, as a cover artist, you, you, you're a remixer. And I always think that these relationships are closer than people realize, that to collect things is also to want to repurpose them. Well, sometimes, I, I mean, sometimes it's really just to, uh, you know, resonate life within them. I know a lot of great collectors, all of their things are in vaults. I know people that own Arthur Rimbaud manuscripts, and they're in vaults. And all my stuff is in my room. I mean, I, I look at it, love it, uh, let it sit outside. You know, I mean, sit outside of, uh, you know, a, a metal box or something. I look at them, and... Uh, um, sometimes I photograph them. That's my way of appropriating things like that. But um, I did naughtily appropriate a, uh, a um, 19th century uh, mathematics book of Ryman's uh, hypothesis uh, for a collage, but it was falling apart anyway. Um, so... I've, you know, I've just read the book about your um, incredibly 
gorgeous account of your, uh, the origins of your collaborative work and collaborative life, really, with, with uh, Robert Mapplethorpe. And the, the, um, you know, the grounding in the visual arts is so fundamental to your work, and yet you're, no, you know, you're known now as a musician and a writer, but you still take photographs. Do you still draw as well? Oh, yes. I mean, I, it's, it's funny because I don't consider myself a musician at all. Uh, I can play a few chords on the guitar. I have no natural gifts as a musician. Uh, obviously, I sing, but uh, I think of myself more as a performer. When I think of myself in terms of my real skills, I would think of myself as an, a writer and a visual artist before I would uh, a musician. But um, I, uh, I don't even remember what the question is. Uh, <laughs> well, sorry. I can, I can uh, pick it up and say, I mean, you, you and I have a funny thing in common that in a couple of weeks we're both uh, graduating uh, with a doctorate in uh, the arts from Pratt, um, which is a kind of a weird thing. Uh, <laughs> A, a, a weird fate for such uh, unruly students as, as you and I. Were, were you ever an, an art student in any official capacity? Well, I studied art history at uh, Glassboro State Teachers College. Um, and then I came, I left, and I came to New York in 67. And really, I studied through Robert. I was drawing at the time. We sat for hours and hours, night after night, drawing and you know, drawing from each other as well as drawing. And uh, I studied in my own way. I love art. Um, one of my ideas when I came uh, to New York in 1967 was to get a job at the Museum of Modern Art as a guide. So I knew the story and history of every painting in the Museum of Modern Art and, you know, tried to pitch that as a job. But they scooted me out. <laughs> but um, um, I, yet like you, an unruly student, but I always dreamed of going to Pratt. I couldn't afford to. I wasn't, uh, like you said, I, I wasn't the best of students. But uh, I, I wondered about this, you know, should I accept this honor? And then I, I thought Robert would really like that. So I, he, he really wanted... When Robert went to Pratt, and we lived together in Brooklyn, if a professor came to look at his work, he always asked the professor to look at my work and critique it. Uh, anything that he knew or understood or contemplated, he shared with me. Um, I don't know what he would think. He had a bachelor, and I'll have a doctorate. But uh, <laughs> Let me ask you um, a little more about the book specifically, and, and, your, and your sort of present role as a memoirist. Um, I mean, it's a very uh, generic and, and maybe kind of pedantic question to ask, but I think I, I'd be very interested in knowing what your writing process is like, how you put this book together, um, you know, and, and whether you are working on another book like it or, or, or want to write another book in the same mode. Well, this book was very difficult because... Robert asked me to write it. He asked me to write it on his deathbed. I wanted to write it. I, I have lots of sources. I have diaries, daily diaries. I know the date when I cut his hair, when I first chopped up my hair, I, when I first met Janis Joplin, when Robert went to a taxi dance for the... I have everything dated. I have uh, lengthy journals. I have his letters. But... After the, Robert died, I had to face the death of my husband, my brother, and my parents, and uh, I found it very difficult to write. And it's only been in the last few years where all of these notes and pages and, and baskets of writing, I was able to sit and then put it all together. And I made a rule for myself, two rules. One that no matter what I remembered or what I had, if I couldn't see what I was writing about as a little movie, then I took it away. Because I wanted the reader to just enter like they were reading a movie. And the other, Robert was not much of a reader. Um, he didn't read hardly at all. So uh, it couldn't be boring. 
or too digressional, or he would just be agitated. So uh, he would say, Patty. I thought, like, for instance, I had a two-page uh, meditation on Nathaniel Hawthorne's desk uh, in there. And uh, don't ask me why. But um, I knew that this had to go. I mean, I can put it somewhere else, but I knew that it was going in an area that might just, you know, sort of stunt the reader, but also agitate Robert. So. Well, I'm, I'm struck by, of course, I was talking about your, your, your art of collage, but in a sense, this was a, a, a collaboration with your own past self. You were collaging these journals and, and notebooks and, and letters. Um, but the book, of course, has an extraordinary quality of compression, and it does, does read as a series of scenes that you enter. So you're, the rule you set for yourself, which is one I'd, I'd love to impart to any writing student I ever encountered, uh, it paid off well, splendidly. It, and I also tried to, the book is filtered through our relationship. It's a very intimate book. And you were asking me about, would I write another? Well, I didn't think I would write another, but I, I couldn't stop writing. Once I had like become friendly with my voice in the book, I, I'm still writing, but what I decided to is to um, write maybe a little trilogy of, of books that all are in the same time period, but from a different angle. Like I could write about that whole time period not filtered through Robert and I, and it would engage in other things, how I write, wrote songs or other people or other things that happened. And uh, I found it very, in that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Well, there are other relationships that seem to become pivot relationships yes. that you allude to, like yeah, I could write a whole, Sam Shepard. Or a whole chapter on William Burroughs, you know. Right. But, uh, but also, we were talking, you know, about uh, Bolano's uh, 2666. Um, it's such a freeing book for a writer because you, uh, the idea of um, uh, entering and re-entering and exiting um, uh, worlds. And I thought it would be very interesting to, you know, expand the world that I began if the people wanted it. Right. And it seems like they might, so. I think they might. <laughs> Thank you. So. I like your sneakers. Thank you. <laughs> they're uh, they're not vintage, but they're the same. Doesn't matter. They're like they're classic. You know? Yeah, class. That's the word, classic. So, well, uh, you know, going from my Ramones sneakers, uh, one of the things, from my own perspective as a as a fan, you know, I was um, I was let's see if I can do this. I was. Uh, 10 years old in 1974. I went to, <laughs> to CBGB's uh, three or four years later for the first time. They used to you let went to CBGB's when oh, you yeah. were 13? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm well, sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, but the, the way that... I wasn't that, even let out of the house when I was 13. <laughs> well, it was, only a, it was only a subway ride. But the way that my friends and I received your career, which was already legendary to us in, you know, 76, 77, 78. I mean, you'd graduated. You and the Talking Heads would not appear in a small club anymore. We'd have to go to, uh, you know, a Winterland or some place. That's not true. I still went back Did you? to, yeah. to right, at, right to the end. It's just that I was often on the road, that's yeah. all. It wasn't well, a philosophy. We were, uh, we were more often in those little clubs seeing you know, our own peers, high school students who'd started bands were now taking over CBGBs. And, and we, would, we would see you guys in these little mini arenas and so on. But the concept of punk was so formative for us. It was so powerful. It made an entire, it created a possibility for us as, as listeners and as a, a subculture that, you know, uh, we, could claim, we could claim our own rock and roll. And that also had its own, had a, had a, a kind of um, a, a adolescent um, quarantine aspect to it. Certain things were decided, decisively uncool or unacceptable. You know, we we didn't 
uh, we didn't let ourselves hear how great the music that had preceded punk was because we needed punk to be our own kind of anthemic thing. Of course, reading your story, it's amazing to see. It shouldn't be shocking, but it was because of the prejudices I find I still have from that punk identity. How completely continuous with the earlier rock and roll, 50s and 60s, and even early 70s, you know, Janis Joplin being a great example. Uh, the development of your role as a, as a performer, as, the, as the, the singer in a rock and roll band, didn't have to do with uh, sweeping the plate clean. Well, the thing, that's really, uh, stu- that's great. I, I love hearing about this because um, people like Lenny Kay and myself, we were born in 1946. We saw from childhood on the entire evolution of rock and roll. And uh, so we came, when, when we started performing in 73 and 74, our goal was not, we were not punk rock. We were uh, guardians, we felt, of our own history. We felt that rock and roll was becoming more corporate, more glamorous, less a cultural voice, and uh, we wanted to remind people that it was a grassroots art, that it was ours, that it was revolutionary, that it belonged to the people, it didn't belong to rich rock stars, it didn't belong to record companies, it belonged to the people. But we were the messengers of this. We were not, you know, please don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing us to Moses, but... (laughs) Lenny and I often thought we were like, we saw the promised land. We saw the future of, for, for generations. We saw rock and roll as being, you know, belonging to the, the streets, the, uh, just uh, people playing in their garages. Anyone could play rock and roll. It was, it, you know, to take some of the, uh, the, the star system out of rock and roll. And so we were more the bridge and uh, the people that came after, uh, the, even like the Sex Pistols, I knew all those people, um, all those kids. They came to our shows. I knew The Clash. Um, but a lot of them, it was necessary for them to, as you said, turn their back on the past because of their method that they had to break through. They had to break through without us and even... Um, despise us and uh, I understood that yeah. I understood that but I'm, I'm not like that I, I, I would feel <clears throat> to me being part of the chain of being that includes you know anyone from Raphael to Coltrane to Allen Ginsberg to Jimi Hendrix to be part of this is something that I embrace. I wouldn't want to turn all of that over. But but really, I have no quarrel with people that need to do that. It's really up to, you know, it's up to the individual and how one declares their existence. I did a similar thing with religion that, you know, certain young people did with, to us or to, you know, the, the dinosaurs of rock and roll, you know, but uh, it's, it's all okay as long yeah. as we keep the blood infused into the medium. Right. Well, you know, for a, for a teenage listener, you were on the side of, of revolution uh, uh, at that time. We would have placed your relationship to um, the, the dinosaurs of rock and roll as a very uh, aggressive one. And, and the irony is that you have always been so engaged with your sources, whether it's William Blake or, or you know, Van Morrison's, uh, you know, song. You've always worn them on your sleeve and celebrated them in this sort of ecstatic way. But by that act, by combining them with an image of renewal and revolution, you could also become a guide back to those sources for someone. Um, what is your, uh, you know, what is your relationship to... Um, present-day music making. Do you listen to a lot of contemporary music uh, when you're thinking about what kind of rec- recording you might make? No, I, I mean, I listen to opera, really. Um, that's what I listen to. But I love 
I mean, and I listen to my son and daughter. My daughter is 22 years old. She's composing all of the time. Uh, I listen to her playing. I listen to her friends. My son is a guitar player. I listen, you know, they, they, they stick stuff on my computer. Like one day I'm looking at my, you know, I have all my opera, and then there's like the yeah, yeah, yeahs, you know. So like, uh, okay, I'll listen to that. Um, the other thing I do is some t I have a MySpace, and uh, I'm not so active in it, but what I do is I got all these friends on it. I go into their, you know, I go to their space, and a lot of them create their own music, and I listen to them and see what they're doing. And I tour, listen to, you know, a lot of young kids give me their CDs. And it, to me, I'm just happy to see it prevail. I don't really, when people ask me, who's the new people? Well, to me, the new people are the unknown people. The new people that I embrace are the people that n we don't even know who they are. I, I just, uh, the people of the future, the kids that are, you know, in their basements or uh, the, the, the group that is struggling out there in Brooklyn or, you know, I, I, it's an abstract thing, but they're, they're the people that I invest my love into. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned your kids and, you know, one of the things that I think is it, it, so stirring uh, to have grown up with your, your career and as your fan, the, the fact that you, the, there's a kind of mysterious, um, uh, you know, period in the middle where you became primarily a, a, a member of a family. And, you know, there's one album in the, in the, in the middle housewife. of that. A housewife. A housewife. <laughs> a suburban housewife. It wasn't quite suburban, quite. but... Uh... Um, I thought I'd try. Um, so there's, there's Dream of Life as this weird signal coming out of that period in the middle. It's an incredible album. And, and then, you know, as we now know, you, you suffered a period of, of losses and transformations, but you also came back to a, a, a time of um, very fertile productivity, and you have this relationship to your grown children, uh, even play music on stage with you at times. This is something that, you know, for people who uh, have a romance of, you know, a, a, a um, alienated romance with, uh, you know, to be creative is to be um, outside of, of, of family. It's, it's, you know, to not have children. Uh, it's something only young people do, and, and you have to make a choice. Well, the... the, the Story of your choices is a very um, stirring one, but it's also um, it's incomplete. We don't know how you felt always about about well, moving out of out of out of New York and out of out of your role as you know the, the the role you'd carved for yourself in the in the career you had here. Well, the role that I carved for myself, we had accomplished. I mean, in in terms of rock and roll. Our mission was to wake people up and create new space for the new guard. Well, the new guard came, and hopefully we created space for them. So I felt that I had accomplished that mission. And I, you know, being on the road and starting to become quite successful uh, and the demands and, and pressures of that and the media, I felt that I wasn't growing as an artist at all. I wasn't growing politically, I wasn't growing spiritually, and I met a really great person. I met Fred Sonic Smith. Um, he had been in the MC5. He had gone through all of the things that I had gone through, and I had a decision. If I wanted to carve a more difficult uh, life with this man or um, continue the way I was going, and uh, I most happily um, went with him. I mean, I, I miss New York City. I love New York City. I missed, you know, the coffee shops. I miss the camaraderie of my band. But uh, it's, it's really um, a misconception that these were not productive years. I, this book, Just Kids, came from years and years and years, and those 16 years of uh, developing a writer's discipline, um, of uh, becoming hopefully a better human being, having children, finding I wasn't in the center of the universe, 
being more empathetic to my fellow man, so I became more knowledgeable politically. Um, and, you know, just seeing how human beings toil. And uh, I had to do all the cooking and the cleaning and the washing the diapers. We didn't have nannies or anything like that. We did everything ourselves. And uh, uh, we didn't make a big income because we both withdrew from pub public life. But for me, it was the, the skills and disciplines that I obtained in those years um, are still, um, they've magnified all my efforts. So uh, it certainly, they certainly weren't lost years. That's a beautiful way to put it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your reading life. You're, you're so engaged with uh, Roberto Bolaño right now, and you've talked about how you tend to have this consuming relationship with very, very large books uh, in succession, you know, that you, you, you spent, you, you described it as a year reading uh, over and over again Herman Hesse's uh, the, the Glass Bead Game. And, um, and that now it's, you know, Bolaño is the, you know, you can't get away from 2666. Um, but I also have heard that you uh, reread certain children's books oh, yeah, over and over again. Oh, yeah, all the time. I, I, I walk with all my books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I reread. Uh, I love Child's Garden of Verses mm -hmm. and love, uh, of course, uh, Songs of Innocence, which isn't a children's book, but my mother gave it to me when I was a child, so I perceived it as a children's book. Pinocchio, um, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan. I read these books. In fact, my goal in life uh, still, which I haven't achieved, I want to, and I've wanted this ever since I was like 10, uh, to write one of those books. I really hope I live long enough to give to the children of the future one wonderful book that they'll love as much as I love Pinocchio. Or the, so, uh, That's great. That's, uh, but I, 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 I love my books. I, I've always loved books. And uh, I, you know, Moby Dick, I guess, was the first big, you know, the first book I, consuming, that uh, I plowed voyages. through, yeah. rereading The Whiteness of the Whale, skipping the whaling chapters. The blubber. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and um, so um, there's nothing more wonderful to me yeah. than the book. Well, um, you've, you've uh, been talking about William Blake. Will you play us the William Blake song? Um, okay, <laughs> if you want. Okay. Um, I mostly write my songs with musicians, um, Lenny Kay being probably the person I've written the most songs with, but occasionally I write a song by myself. And... Uh, I wrote this little song when I was having a lot of strife, when I felt unappreciated, which I know might seem ridiculous because obviously I'm well appreciated, but it's all relative, you know, sometimes you feel unappreciated. And, uh, and I was thinking about this sort of feeling sorry for myself and I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, this song was in my head and uh, it was just like the answer and the answer was that, remember, William Blake, who gave us such beautiful songs, poems, was an activist, a humanist, a philosopher, an artist, um, a printer, and also a casualty of the Industrial Revolution, and was barely had any success in his own lifetime. Uh, not only that, was ridiculed, um, died uh, penniless and was nearly forgotten. So, um, and yet, William Blake was always uh, grateful for his visionary powers, never let them go, and did his work, even on his deathbed. He was working on illustrations to Dante on his deathbed, so, uh, uh, and still speaking to his angels. So, uh, I just try to remember William Blake when I feel sorry for myself, which isn't too often. In my Blake. 
again year I was so disposed toward a mission yet unclear advancing pole by pole by chin breathed into my ear obey the simple code when road is paved in gold when road is just a road in my black and year such a woeful schism the pain in our existence was not as I envisioned Boots that tramp from track to track Worn down to the soul When road is paved in gold When road is just a road In my black and year Temptation, yet a hiss Just a shallow spear Robed in cowardice Brace yourself for bitter flack For a life divine A labyrinth of riches Never shall unwind The tears that bind the pilgrim sack are stitched into the blakey and back. So throw off your stupid cloak. Embrace all that you fear. Cause joy will conquer all despair in my blakeyan year. So throw off your stupid cloak. Embrace all that you fear Cause joy will conquer all despair In my Blakeyan year In my Blakeyan year In my Blakeyan year Thank you. Um, okay, I've been hogging you, so I'm gonna <laughs> invite. Uh, no, I've been folks hogging to, you oh, okay. because uh, you've been very generous in spending all this time asking me questions when I know we could very easily turn it around because you're a fine writer and. Uh, you wrote such beautiful essays, and it's very generous of you to spend this time letting me do all the talking. A great privilege. Or a lot of the talking. A great so privilege. Thank you. I, there are two microphones here, and if people have questions, they should come up and, um, and, and pick one of them. And I don't know quite how much longer we've got, but we'll do this uh, until we're done. And... Um, and I'm just going to be a tiny bit of a hard ass and say, uh, because it's a, the time is tight, not anecdotes, but questions. Thank you. Question? Anybody? A brave soul. How about the uh, connection between Allen Ginsberg, William Blake, and Walt Whitman? What? The difference? The connection. The, the, connection. Oh, the connection. The, the lineage, now you, and you're part of that? or? Well, I mean, if you want to talk about connection... Allen Ginsberg, who is my great friend and teacher, um, spoke to me about this. Uh, actually, Alan and I used to talk about this, that we have like two family, we have two trees. We have the genetic family tree, and we have our more, uh, the spiritual artist golden chain uh, tree. And uh, 
um, Alan really felt his connection, um, it's almost like you can choose your ancestors. And we used to play a game like, who are your, your ancestors? And his were, um, uh, of course, Walt Whitman and, uh, and, and William Blake. And each, William Blake, Walt Whitman, and Allen Ginsberg, all three of these men reached out to people that reached out to the poets and writers and human beings of their time in the future to animate their creative impulse, to, to, to understand that they had it first. And then Walt Whitman saying, poet, young poet, 250 years from now, young poet who does not exist, I am thinking of you now, I am with you now. Allen Ginsberg embraced that. Ah, Walt Whitman is with me. And he walked with Walt Whitman. He walked, truly walked with Blake. And uh, I think of them all. Uh, I did a lot of walking with uh, William Burroughs because we both love detectives. Well, well, thank you. And Alan's in the house. Thanks. Um, Patty, I'm from former Soviet Union. So first of all, I want to tell you how much... Uh, big role you and Robert Maplethorpe and all this generation Thank played you. for us when we were starting um, our own revolutions against the Absolutely. Soviet stuff in 80s and 90s, and I want to thank you for that. I also want to thank you for your wonderful uh, life and your describing, and I'm really looking forward to buying this book about how you went back to with your family and raised kids and, and then came back and didn't lose a track, and that really means a lot to us to see that, you know, the oldest world of 60s, the wonderful freedom world of 60s was not just uh, saying no to the family and saying no to children, but it was saying no to the petty bourgeois desires of the small kind of uh, world. So since we had the period, unfortunately, the world right now, we also and everyone is looking since the destroying of the so-called Cold, Cold War area. And we actually fought the Soviets always because we knew about you guys in 60s and 70s and it was the same spirit of liberation from this slavery. And you guys, Janis Joplin, all these guys were, uh, for us, it was not Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher. That's, that's, that's bullshit who says that. It was you guys who really generated this revolution in the Soviet Union. So my question is very simple. In 2010... 2010, are we condemned to live in a bourgeois slavery or that could be some freedom coming from your experience? Thank you. What, what is the question? Are we condemned to live in bourgeois slavery? I don't think that we're condemned to do anything. We're, as long as we're alive, we, can, we, we have choices. And it, it, actually, I don't even know what bourgeois slavery is since I've never experienced it. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure exactly what that means. But uh, I, I think, you know, each, each generation has to translate for themselves. Uh, I myself never felt condemned to anything. Um, I always felt like, you know, no matter what the situation, one could either imagine or create their own portal out of there. So, uh, you know, we have either our physical ability to, do, to change or we have our imagination in times of imprisonment. So that's the only thing I can say about that. Thanks. Yes? I, I would I, like to ask you about how do you experience limitations to freedom of expression. Obviously, you are a wonderful free spirit with wonderful words, but there are so many visible institutionalized or invisible informal restrictions uh, to our freedom of speech. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm lucky. I mean, being an American, I have obviously uh, enjoyed, um, you know, freedom of speech as part of our heritage. Uh, of course, it's, uh, um, one still has to continually fight for this, but it, I, I don't know how to answer questions like that because, you know, we just, uh, each human being, it's like what he just asked. We have to decide, you know, what we want, and if we're in a situation where we have to die for that, 
then we have to choose whether we want to die. People have, they did die in the revolution, you know, in, the, in, in my country, uh, in this country, um, they died for their freedom. You know, people die for your freedom. Uh, I, we, we, you just have to decide. Sometimes people ask me that, and all they're talking about is a record company doesn't want them to, you know, put a certain song on their CD. Well, you know, fuck them, you know, put it on or leave, you know. I mean, I've never been suppressed by, I mean, radios, I've, I, I've had like records banned. I've had people not play my uh, records or something because I spoke out about it against rock because I wrote a song called Rock and Roll Nigger. But I still did the work, you know. You just keep doing your work, you know. If, if, if uh, you know, a, a corporation or a big company won't put out your work, you go out on the streets, you know. Before I had a record label, we made our own records and went to parks and sold them for a dollar or, you know, read poems out in, you know, in, in the streets, and I still do that. I still go to, all over the world and still will go in a square with my guitar and just sing a song. We're a lot less confined than people think. Obviously, there are some cultures and some places where I can't even project what that's like, but we are a lot less confined than we... Uh, uh, when people complain, especially in this country, that they're confined, there's always a way out. There's always a way out. You just have to keep pushing, as Jim Morrison said, break on through to the other side. But as you see, I'm not very politically astute. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like a big St. Bernard. I just go bounding in any situation and, uh, you know, do what I'm there to do, and if people don't like it, they can, you know, throw me out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but it seems like when you first came to New York, you were really able to engage with this entire community of young artists, and I guess my question is, from the way the city has changed and the whole nature of the way we communicate with people has changed. Do you think it's still possible for a young artist to kind of come to the city and find that community? Well, now? when I first came to New York City, I didn't, I didn't have any money. I didn't know anybody. I did know a few people at Pratt Institute, which is a ready-made situation. I mean, obviously, a school, a college, a place of higher learning is a ready-made situation for a community. But I didn't go to school. Uh, I met people, and we did develop uh, communities. It's much harder in New York City, almost impossible to do what we did back then because of how it's changed economically. In the 60s, New York City was down and out. It was a bankrupt city. You know, there was often garbage strikes. You could get an apartment for $60 a month in the East Village. You could, uh, you know, build a, you know, a whole community of transvestites or a whole community of, of actors and poets and singers or a, a political community. It was much easier because uh, we could get shitty jobs and, uh, and, and get a shitty little apartment without a bathroom, but we were alive and we were together. And uh, New York has closed itself off to uh, the young and the struggling, but there's always other cities, you know. I don't know, Detroit, Poughkeepsie, Newark, you know, you have to find the new place because New York City has been taken away from you. But uh, it's still a great city, but it has uh, closed itself off from this, the, the poor and uh, creative burgeoning society. So my advice is find a new city. <laughs> Hello, Patty. I just wanted to um, thank you for how intimate you and Just Kids, you shared your experience when you were 19. Um, I went through a similar experience. I'm 19 as well and also lost a child when I, um, the, over the past year. And I just appreciate how your strength prevailed and your 
creative expression didn't die down or you didn't let depression get in way of that after a traumatic experience such as that, as losing, well, in your case, giving up a child after for adoption. I just admire your strength and your ability to share that with Well, it was a hard choice to talk about it. Um, But, you know, it's nothing I'm, uh, of course, not ashamed of. It was very painful. And and I also want to protect all of the people involved in that. But, But really, you know, the things that happen to us when we're young do seem more almost it seems exquisitely painful and sometimes we feel we won't get over it. I cried really for like two years. Um, didn't even know why I was crying, but we prevail. The human, the, you know, the, the human beings are so strong. The things that we have gone through in the evolution of being a human being, and believe me, in your life, you will suffer again, but you also have a million wonderful things that happen. So we have to just try to think in our life. I have a lot of rough things that happen in my life, but I don't look at them as the stepping stones of being a human being. You try to pick the, the beautiful things. Your given life, your first you know, sense of your own imagination, your first sense of God, your first feeling of love, even, you know, the beauty of feeling when you lose somebody, you feel them in your heart. So, you know, pain is a really important part of being a human being. You wouldn't want to live without it. It just, it's like having, if you had summer, I mean, this is why the seasons are beautiful. So, anyway. Well, I- You'll Thank be you. fine. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to say that reading your book was almost the pushing of helping me just find my way again in terms of like, expressing myself and not holding it. And so I appreciate your honesty and your strength. Admire well, it. appreciate your honesty, too. And now you can just forge on. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So we'll be able to do just three more. Thank you, everyone who's been courageous enough to step up. I'm sorry if we won't get to every last question. Cool. Um, Can you talk about your experience of finding a discipline as a an artist and a writer? Because I, I don't. I think it's kind of a generally everybody kind of experiences if they're a writer particularly. It can be a pretty gruesome and painful and awful experience. You mean the discipline of work? Yeah, like finding a kind of routine. Well, well you know, I, I worked steady jobs since I was 14 till from like 62 to uh, 72 so, or 73. So I, I've, I've experienced the 9 to 5 job. So that was the real painful experience <laughs> of discipline. But uh, in terms of uh, exercising your uh, imagination, or exercising your skills. Um, The mind and the heart and the imagination are all muscles and they must be exercised. And I think it's very important for us as human beings to set uh, goals for ourselves. Um, I just made a vow with myself when I was very young uh, that I had to write something every day, even if it was a piece of conversation I heard from others if I didn't have anything to say myself, to be attentive to what people were saying, or to record a dream when I woke up in the morning. And I can honestly say, I would say about 90% of my life, I have written at least one line. Sometimes it's like several pages, but sometimes it's like literally four words. But if you apply, give yourself certain, you know, you, you set, you know, it's almost like uh, uh, the happy prison of existence. Sometimes I pretend I'm a, I'm a prisoner, and, you know, if I don't write my word, I'm going to get solitary confinement. But um, <laughs> in any event, whatever game you play with yourself, uh, discipline is a beautiful thing. It's like people that do a lot of 
uh, yoga or they do a lot of exercising, after a while, your body craves that. And if you sit and make yourself look at a blank page or write or look at your canvas or your violin, uh, work with it just a little, and after a time, you'll crave it. And uh, so anyway, that's my... Cool. My, uh, Thank you. And buy yourself a nice pen and notebook. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just joking. Hi, Patty. My name is Claudia, and I just wanted to thank you so much for being here and Thanks, sharing Claudia. your um, how you've been inspired by books. And I was especially excited to hear that of your love for children's books and um, how you want to write one at some point, because I happen to be an editor <laughs> at HarperCollins <laughs> Children's Books. So my question is, would you like my business card? <laughs> I'll take it. I'll wait forever for your call. Uh. Last one. Hi. This is our, uh, before uh, we have our last uh, uh, person. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I only met Jonathan today, so uh, already I have a new friend. And... uh, so it was really great to talk yeah, to you. Great pleasure. And I love talking in this historic hall and uh, being part of the Penn Festival. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff, uh, and I live in New Jersey. Um, actually, I'm gonna, I'll say one thing that I'm very proud of, which is that my son's going to be a student here next year, and that's pretty remarkable. And that makes me feel special to hear you here. Um, You've created a lot of art in your lifetime. And I guess I have my own opinion, having read your book and having the point of view that it should be the National Book Award winner. But where do you put it, where do you rank this book if you can, in all of the art you've created? Well, the, I don't, you know, I don't think like that, obviously, but one thing I will say is that the thing that makes me the most proud of the book uh, is that the people have embraced it. Um, I have no problem in, in that a lot of my work might live in obscurity, uh, might not even uh, greet the public eye, but I didn't write this book to be obscure. I wanted people to read it. I wanted people to know Robert as I had known him. I was hoping that it might inspire, uh, especially, well, give some kind of um, feeling to people of my generation, but inspire new generations. And the fact that the people seem really to like it, uh, they come up to me on the street and tell me, um, I, that, that makes me really happy. Um, it has nothing to do with art so much as it has to do with communication. Sometimes an artist creates without thought of communicating with anyone because we're just impelled to create and might create a poem that is so obscure that no one really can penetrate it. But sometimes we do things uh, solely or most importantly, to communicate. And I feel, if nothing else, uh, because one should not critique their own work, uh, that the people have let me know that I have somehow successfully communicated this nice, very nice little story to them. If I might say, it's, it is great communication, but it is truly a work of art. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. That was great.